Daniel Webster was a powerful statesman and spent the better part of 40 years involved in national politics, so many years as a congressman representing his home state of New Hampshire, and then uh, another great number of years as a U.S. Senator from the state of Massachusetts. He also served twice as Secretary of State under three different presidents and was a three-time candidate for President of the United States. Well, story is told that one day Webster's father, who was very strict, was to be away for the day and he left Daniel and his older brother Ezekiel specific instructions of work that he wanted them to accomplish while he was gone. But upon his return, he found the tasks were still undone. And so he questioned his sons about their idleness. And he said, well, Ezekiel, what have you been doing? Ezekiel answered, nothing, sir. And then he turned to Daniel and said, well, Daniel, what have you been doing? Daniel thought for a moment and he said, helping Zeke, sir. That sounds like people, some people that I know today, their attitude is, why should I do something if no one else does? Or there's nothing I have to offer or some think, why should I do this or that? Isn't that what we pay people for? And sadly, not in this church, thank goodness, but in churches that I have been in, I have run across people who feel that way about their service to the church. Their reactions are, isn't that what we pay a preacher for? Because some people incorrectly assume that if a church is to grow, it is solely the preacher's responsibility. And if it doesn't happen, it is his or her fault. Now, I will tell you up front, yes, the pastor has a great deal to do with what goes on in a church, but it's not solely my responsibility if something doesn't work or my praise and applause if it does. A uh, good example is our vacation Bible school. I had very little to do with Bible school, especially this week with some things that happened. But that's a good example of why other people step in. This church, our body, of a family here at a group work together just like your families do at home. Paul has given us a clue in our scripture today about how we as Christians should respond to God's calling in, in our lives. And he, he lists seven different gifts. He says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesizing, let him use it to prophesize on his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, then let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage others. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do this cheerfully. Now, I'm not going to look at all seven of these things this morning, but I do want to look at three of these and see what our connection is in our own personal service to God. And the first one I want to look at is called encouraging. Paul said that if our gift is encouraging, we should encourage others. I read the story not too long ago about a preacher who was leaving the church after several years of service there, and at the farewell dinner, the preacher tried to encourage the members by saying, don't be sad, the next preacher might be better than me. To which one member replied, that's what the last preacher said, and it keeps getting worse. Now, that's kind of like saying, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Author William Howard says, flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you, but encourage me, and I will never forget you. The gift of encouragement is a very special gift, and it is so greatly needed everywhere in our churches, in our families, in our workplaces, in our community, and around the world, everywhere. Folks, as Christians, we must build others up and find the positives in the lives, not just in, in people we know, but in other people's lives too. The positiveness in things of people that we know and, and we help. Paul reminds us, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. We all need to do that. We all need to encourage one another. And we, and we can all do that. 
We are in the building business here, folks, as Christians, regardless of whether we are extremely gifted at it or not. And we should all speak words that build others up and encourage them. Anyone can say something nice about someone if they think about it. And on the other side of the coin, any one of us could say something hurting or derogatory or insulting about someone else. We as Christians need to follow the example of Christ. We need to try to encourage one another. We all need to try as hard as we can to encourage one another. And then the second gift I want to talk about is leading. The news writer Calvin Thomas found himself in one of the leading Christian magazines being called a Christian leader. And he responded by saying, I don't know what that means as it refers to me. However, in a church that I once attended, there was a man of tremendous faith. His wife was an alcoholic. His daughter had psychological problems. He was often in poor health himself. Yet week after week, he never complained. He always smiled and asked me how I was doing. He faithfully brought to church a blind man every week who had no transportation. And he always sat with him and helped him sing the hymns. That man is a Christian leader if ever there was one. Pastor Tony Evans said, church leadership should be determined by spirituality, not notoriety. I worked with people for 27 years at the police department that were in leadership roles, but I can certainly promise you that they were not leaders in the moral or spiritual sense by any, any stretch of the imagination. Folks, we can't lead other people to Christ if we don't personally know him ourselves. You cannot teach or preach the gospel of the good news of Christ if you don't first believe it and live it in your own lives. And not just here on Sunday, every day. People are mistaken sometimes when they feel like they come here on Sunday for an hour or so and their spiritual and moral obligations are filled. That's true for today. What about tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow? We need to do these things every day. The uh, biblical scholar Matthew Henry, I'm sure many of you have read commentaries by Henry, went to London and met a wealthy young lady and fell in love, wanted to marry her. So the young lady went to her father and told him that she and Henry were in love and wanted to get married. And her father's response was, he's got no background. We don't know where he's come from. The daughter responded, yes, I know that. But I know where he's going and I want to go with him. A good leader, folks, knows where he is going and knows who is traveling the road with him, guiding him, helping him, and blessing him. And then thirdly, Paul talks about demonstrating mercy. Mercy is kind of a, a funny word. It's, a lot of people aren't really sure what mercy is. Calvin Coolidge, early and often in his presidency, supposedly awoke one morning in his motel room to find a cat burglar going through his pockets. And Coolidge spoke up and asked this burglar not to take his watch chain because it contained an, an engraved charm on it that he wanted to keep. But then he began visiting with this young man. He engaged him in conversation and discovered that he was a college student who had no money to pay his hotel bill or to buy a train ticket back to campus. And so Coolidge supposedly took $32 out of his wallet, which he gave to the student as a loan, encouraging him and promising, and the young man promised to pay this back to him. That's what mercy is. That's what mercy is all about. And another story that I read recently about uh, after Robert E. Lee's surrender from the Civil War, Lincoln was speaking to a large group, a large crowd from a balcony above the White House, and he told them how considerate he wanted to be in policy to the south and he gave them his policy and at the end of the speech a northern senator said why should we be kind to these people what should we do with them and the, vind the vindictive crowd yelled back we should hang them well Lincoln's 11 year old son was there with him turned to Lincoln and said no papa don't hang them hang on to them help them be merciful to them believing in someone else in spite of their guilt and their sin, folks, is an act of mercy. Mercy is what we want. It's what we need. It's what we have to have if we are to be good Christians. But 
sadly, it's not always what we give to others. And we should. Because as Jesus reminds us, blessed are the merciful because they will be shown mercy. Now, I'm not the brightest light bulb in the lamp, but I can tell you this. From reading this, I know that if I'm not merciful toward other people, God isn't going to be merciful toward me. That's basically what Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who show mercy to others, for they will be shown mercy indeed. Paul reminds those in Ephesia, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. And even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by his grace you have been saved. God's grace. That's what mercy is. God's grace. And I've shared with you before what grace is. G-R-A-C-E is God's riches at Christ's expense. All of the love and the peace and the joy and the hope that God brings into our lives are his spiritual gifts. And they come to us at a cost. At the expense of the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul also told Titus when the kindness and love of our Savior appeared, he saved us not by righteous things that we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We read a lot in Scripture about God's mercy toward us and how God expects us to treat others and to encourage others and to forgive others and to love others. And that should tell us something. That should tell us that we have our own faults and our own shortcomings. So let us try to hang on to others who fall short of our expectations and not hang them, but hang on to them and show them the same mercy that God shows us. Irma Bombeck, who all of you know as an author and television personality, is quoted as saying, When I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I wouldn't have one single bit of talent left and that I could say, Lord, I used everything you gave me. Folks, we must be committed to doing something in this life. Helping others doing God's work and following God's word here in our church and in our families and in our community and wherever the need arises, we must be committed to do something for others in life. We must use whatever God has given us to bless others and to help others anywhere, any place, any time because we were not created, folks, to sit on the sidelines selfishly saying, why should I do anything? Let somebody else do it. That's not my responsibility. We know that we can't do everything. That's what we've been talking about the last few weeks. But we can do something. And what we can do is encourage one another. We can lead one another to salvation. And we can show the same mercy to others. Mercy that God continually shows to us and gives to us each one of us, and then one day we also can say, Lord, I couldn't do everything, but I did do something, and I used every gift and every talent that you gave me. May God bless each and every one of you, and may you this day turn to the Lord and share that mercy that you get with others around you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.